Hey guys, welcome back to my channel Easy Dental by Dr. Asmat. So the topic which we are going to discuss today is radix intermolaris and paramolaris. So basically this radix intermolaris and paramolaris, these are the anatomical variations which are seen in the mandibular molars. So if you are planning to do root canal treatment of mandibular molars which is having a radix, then you have to be extra cautious. Okay, because these are the anatomical variations and you have to take precautionary measures while doing your root canal treatment. So everybody knows that the main goal of doing the endodontic treatment is to remove all the debris, all the bacteria from the root canal by using biomechanical preparation. Then you have to obturate it so that we can obtain a hermetic seal. So as to prevent the spread of infection or reinfection. So this is the main purpose why we are doing the root canal treatment. Now when we are doing these non-surgical root canal treatment, in some cases there is still even after doing a good root canal treatment you see that there are chances of failure. Okay, so why is that failure happening? It is happening because of one of the most important reason that you are missing the additional roots or root canals. Okay, there is some extra root, there is some extra canal that you are not preparing, that you are not obturating and because of that your uh, chances of success is decreasing. Okay, so this missed canal or missed root is very important when you are planning to do a root canal treatment. Now in mandibular first molar, they display a lot of anatomical variations. So in Caucasians population, it has been seen that the first molars, they are usually two rooted. So one is the mesial root, one is the distal root. And in the mesial root, there are two mesial canals and usually the distal root is having only a single distal canal. So in most of the cases it has been seen that the mesial root they are having two canals and uh, a lot of cases these two canals they exit as two distinct apical foramen but sometimes they also they can merge together and they end up in one single foramen. Okay this was about the mesial root and the mesial canals. Now in distal root, usually it has been seen that there is only one kidney shaped root canal and sometimes a second distal canal may also be present. So this radix entomolaris, what is this radix entomolaris and one term is radix entomolaris, one term is radix paramolaris. So you need to know the difference between these two terms. So this radix entomolaris, it is an additional third root in the mandibular molar. Okay, and this uh, this term it was described by Carbillet. So the supernumerary root of the mandibular molars, that is the additional root, it is located distolingual to the mesial root of the mandibular molars. This I'm talking about the radix entomolaris. So that extra root, radix is the root. So that extra root it is located distolingual to the mesial root of mandibular molars. And in radix paramolaris, that extra root, it is located mesiobuccal side of the distal root of the mandibular molar. So this location is very important. You need to know where is radix entomolaris, where is radix paramolaris, right? Now these are the clinical images of the extracted mandibular molars which was having a radix entomolaris or paramolaris. So in this uh, figure A, you can see that it, there's a first molar with a radix entomolaris and this view is distolingual view. So all these extra roots you can see these are the radix. Either it is entomolaris, depends on the location or it can be paramolaris. So you can see sometimes these roots they are fully mature. In some cases you can see that the roots, that extra root, it is very small and conical so it depends it depends on case to case what type of radix you are finding now we need to know about the prevalence of radix entomolaris and paramolaris so basically it has been seen as a separate root in first mandibular molar and it is associated with certain ethnic groups so in african populations there is a maximum frequency of three percent 
of these type of cases while in eurasian and indian populations the frequency is less than 5% in mongoloid populations like the chinese eskimo and american indians uh, it has been seen that the radix entomolaris occurs in the range of 5 to more than 30 percent sorry and in caucasians these uh, radix they are not very common radix entomolaris and it has a frequency of 3.4 to 4.2 percent now this radix entomolaris it, it can be seen in the first second or third mandibular molar but it is least frequently found on the second molar and most commonly found in the first mandibular molar and some reports have also been suggested that there is a bilateral occurrence of radix entomolaris and that percentage can range from 50 to 67 percent now if you talk about radix paramolaris it is very rare as compared to radix entomolaris so it is uh, it has been observed in 1.5 to 3 percent of african population and it is very frequent in indian population so it's its frequency is like about uh, two percent so it was the prevalence so most commonly if you are finding uh, in indian population you will see that um, the most common type of radix is radix entomolaris coming to etiology so there can be a lot of reasons and that reason is still not clear why there is a formation of radix entomolaris or paramolaris so first thing it could be due to the external factors during the odontogenesis or it can be because of the penetrance of a atavistic gene now what is this atavism it is the reappearance of a trait after several generations of absence so it can be because of that factor or it can be because of the racial genetic factors so the etiology is still not known well now if we talk about the morphology of the radix entomolaris and paramolaris so this thing we have already uh, discussed that that radix entomolaris it is located distolingually and its coronal third it can be completely or partially fixed to the distal root and the dimensions of radix entomolaris it can vary from a short conical type of root to a mature root you have seen in the figure which i have shown previously so it can be a very short conical extension or it can be a mature root I, uh, usually the normal length and length of the root as well as the length of the root canal and the radix entomolaris it is smaller than the distobuccal and mesial roots and it can be either separate or it can be fused with the other roots then clinically uh, the tooth with additional distolingual root may present as a more bulbous crown outline so you have seen that in these type of cases sometimes when you see the tooth you can identify that yeah i can uh, encounter some type of anatomical or morphological variation in this tooth so by looking at the crown itself the crown can be more bulbous there can be additional cusp, there can be a prominent distolingual lobe or cervical prominence. So by looking at all these things, you can actually guess that, yeah, it can have a anatomical variation. And radiographically, that third root, it is visible in 90% of the cases. And sometimes in radiographs also, you can miss that root because of its slender dimension or it can either overlap with the distal root so because of that uh, in your radiographs you are not able to see that root but if you take radiographs with different angulations then definitely you'll be able to find that additional root so additional radiographs can be taken from different horizontal angles like it can be taken from 20 degree mesial or 20 degree distal angulations okay and then you can uh, while doing the uh, root canal treatment of these type of uh, teeth which is having a radix so you can either use magnifying loops or you can use microscopes or intraoral cameras so all these things they will enhance your uh, like chances of success and also uh, if uh, on the radiographs if you are not able to diagnose that there is some additional root you can go for cbct now there are several classifications given by Carl L. Alexanderson. So they described four types of radix entomolaris on the basis of the location of the cervical part. So type A is 
distally located cervical part with two normal distal root components okay that cervical part of the radix intermolaris it is located distally and it is having two normal distal root components then type b is same as type a but only one normal distal component then type c is mesially located cervical part and type ac is central location of this uh, extra root between the mesial and distal root components so you can see all these figures and you can identify which classification it your your case comes under then another classification was given by de moore et al in 2004 and he gave the classification based on the curvature in the buccolingual orientation so type 1 it refers to a straight root or root canal that these all things we are talking about the extra root additional root okay so uh, type 1 is straight root or root canal type 2 is initially curved entrance is there but it continues as a straight root or canal and then type 3 is there is an initial curve in the coronal third of the root canal and then a second buccally oriented curve is there starting from middle to apical third another next classification was given by song js et al and he gave two new uh, variants of radix intermolaris so first is small type that is length of the radix intermolaris is shorter than half of the length of the distobuccal root and another uh, classification was based on the uh, sorry another thing is the conical type so it this this type of radix is smaller than the small type and having no root canal within it so one is the small type one is the conical type then uh, based on the x-ray overlap degree also there is a classification so type 1 is a slightly overlapped image type 2 is moderately overlapped image and type 3 is severe overlapped image so these in type 3 type cases it's very difficult to identify that it is a radix or there is some anatomical variations so you have to you have, or, even if you're starting any case take uh, pre-operative radiographs from two or three angles okay then uh, about the radix paramolaris also the classification was given by carlson and alexanderson so type a it refers to a radix paramolaris in which the cervical part is located on the mesial root complex and type b refers to the uh, radix paramolaris in which the cervical part is located centrally between the mesial and distal root complexes then if you talk about the morphology of radix paramolaris so this uh, radix is located mesiobuccally and the dimensions can vary from short conical extension to a mature root similar to that of radix entomolaris now what type of clinical approach you have to take when you encounter these type of cases so the endodontic success it depends on correct diagnosis it depends upon the anatomy or morphology then how is the canal configuration and the clinical approach you are taking while uh, doing the root canal treatment so, so diagnosis uh, can be done from the preoperative radiograph and in the radiograph you can find some unclear outline of the distal root contour so these outlines they can indicate the presence of a hidden radix entomolaris or paramolaris then another thing is that you can take x-ray from different angles using the slob rule that is same lingual opposite buccal rule then uh, you can take another radiograph from a more distal or mesial angulations like 30 degree mesial angulations or 30 degree distal angulation so from all these radiographs it will be clear whether you are encountering an additional root or not so this angle radiograph that is 25 to 30 degree angulation so it is more useful and it has been said that the mesial angle radiograph is better than distal angle radiograph for radix entomolaris detection then first thing was the radiograph then you have to clinically inspect the crown is the crown bulbous are you finding any additional cusp on the crown or what is the cervical outline of the crown so all these things will tell you that yeah there can be chances of an uh, anatomical morph uh, or morphological variations so first thing is clinical inspection of the crown then you have to analyze the cervical morphology of the root by using periodontal probe 
and then if you're finding an extra cusp that is tuberculum paramolar or if you're finding that uh, there is a prominent occlusal distal or distolingual lobe in combination with cervical prominence or convexity so all these things can indicate the presence of an additional root now if we talk about radix entomolaris there can be a presence of prominent occlusal distal or distolingual lobe in combination with cervical prominence and in radix paramolaris that additional root is always associated with the extra cusp that is known as tuberculum paramolar on the buccal side and also the cervical part of the radix paramolaris is also more prominent then if you talk about the location of orifice of the root canal so the orifice of radix entomolaris it is located distolingual to mesiolingual from the main canal in the distal root okay you have to look on the uh, look at the distal root and it could be located somewhere distolingually or mesiolingually so an extension of the triangular opening cavity to the distolingual results in a more rectangular or trapezoidal outline form okay you have to search the orifice then concerning the axis cavity in the presence of radix paramolaris there you have to extend the trapezoidal axis cavity mesiobuccally so as to find the uh, orifice of the radix paramolaris then the distance between the radix paramolaris canal orifice and the mesial root canal complex it is almost double than the distance between the two mesial canal orifice okay you have to see all these things then these type of radix either it is entomolaris or paramolaris there is a lot of variations and complexity in the anatomy so when you are doing your root canal treatment there can be significant problems you can encounter in the form of uh, perforation like furcal or strip perforation or while doing these type of cases there can be vertical root fracture or weakening of the root or straightening of the root canal or you can uh, encounter ledge formation there can be loss of working length okay so all these things all these uh, mishaps can happen when you are preparing these type of teeth so you have to be extra cautious when you identify the orifice of the uh, radix then first thing you have to do is you have to always use your smaller k files okay make good light path coronal pre flaring is very important so you have to follow all the precautionary steps all the basic steps that is needed uh, in the root canal treatment so that you can encounter so that you can give the best treatment to your patient so always uh, when you are encountering these type of cases always be patient do not uh, be in a hurry and try to be calm and try to do all the steps regarding the protocols okay so that's it for today's video thank you for watching and please uh, if you like my channel or my content please like and subscribe my channel bye bye thank you